Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming today. It's really a pleasure to be hosted here at uh, the Overseas Development Institute. Uh, your work, Marta, and that of your group, David Booth and Lenny and Alina and others, has been, I think, pioneering and, and very helpful on a whole range of issues. So it's perfectly fitting in our view that we, we help launch the event, uh, the book here in London with, with your group, and we thank you for that. What I'm going to try to do, it's hard to summarize a book in 10 or 20 minutes, so I'm going to try to give you a thumbnail sketch of our argument. I'll set that out, explaining a bit about, in a sense, why we wrote the book and what its purpose is and what the main arguments are. I'm going to then turn to Deanne, who's going to highlight some of the current areas of particular continuing uncertainty, then come back to me where I'll, I'll conclude as to where we are, and we'll try to do that fairly, fairly briefly. <coughs> this book has, we wrote it for several reasons. <coughs> We were really struck in the last, well, in my case, the last five to seven years, how much talk about taking politics into account, being political, acting politically, has entered the development world. We were struck both by how common that had become and how incoherent those discussions were, how at different organizations people meant very different things by it, even often within the same organization people meant different things. And we were just startled both by, I think, the importance of the topic, but the lack of clarity about it. So we wanted to try to write a single volume that would, to some extent, get its analytic arms around the whole topic and try to bring some order to that. Secondly, I had watched, really throughout my entire career, uh, two communities, uh, one that's much more political, the sort of democracy support community and the more traditional development community, work side by side, often in the same country at the same time, sometimes with the same partners doing sometimes different things and actually sometimes doing almost the same thing but sometimes for different purposes or with different language and I've been puzzled by that for a long time and tried to play a role in bringing these two communities somewhat closer to each other at least to talk and to listen to each other but in some cases also to work more effectively together. Third, we also try in this book, particularly looking at the last 25 years, which we think is the crucial period for evolution in this question of politics and development, to try to see, in a sense, a simple question of, is this uh, a river, an evolution of thinking and action that's, that's progressing in some sense? Or are we in a kind of whirlpool where the same concepts appear again and again? You'll hear a concept like empowerment, and you'll go back and aid documents in the 1990s, the 1980s, the 1970s. 1960s, in participation. Ideas, and Deanne and I, she <coughs> was always testing me as we were writing the book, we played a game called Guess the Decade, where she would send me a quote from a policy document by an aid agency, and I would have to guess within 10 years of when that quote was written. And, and let me tell you, it's we're thinking of patenting this game, actually, and seeing if we can market it. Uh, so, and it's, uh, it's devilishly difficult to tell whether this is 1962 or 1982 or 2012. And we wanted to try to come to terms with the question of is there really evolution here or are we simply caught in a kind of a feel-good whirlpool of concepts that keep coming again and again. And then fourthly, the purpose was to what extent is there convergence among the main actors? And when we say mainstream aid organizations, there's a little bit of a definition of that in the book, but we mean the mainstream aid organizations. We mean the large Western donor agencies or organizations. Uh, including some of the multilaterals, and to what extent they all sound the same to some extent on paper, although there are some differences in the policy documents, but they're fairly similar on paper, but to what extent in practice or behind the doors of the agencies are they really thinking and acting differently about these concepts? So we try to do that a bit as well. Now, <coughs> when we talk about politics and development, it's first it's <coughs> important to try to clarify to see if we can understand what we're talking about. And when we talk about this subject, <coughs> Some observers immediately react and say, how can you bring <coughs> politics back into development? It never left. It's always there. Development is political. And they get upset when you talk about politics and development as though you're pretending it's apolitical when it's not. And what they mean by that, what annoys them in many cases, and I'd say they're right to be annoyed generally, is first, of course, is that mainstream aid providers usually always are working with political motivations. There are reason, there's a reason they're giving more aid to Pakistan than to Malawi because they have concerns in Pakistan that make them do that. And aid is clearly political in a deeper sense. That's a fact of life. Secondly, <coughs> aid is political in the sense that you can you know, say that, no, no, we really have socioeconomic goals here. We're really not being political. We're just trying to help the health sector of this country or the privatization. And people say, wait a minute. These economic choices are political choices. Neoliberalism is a political choice to some extent. So how could you claim to be apolitical? And these observers, uh, who often come from the left of center, feel that the aid community has denied being political for a long time, pretends it doesn't have a other political motive. 
motivations, pretends that its economic choices are free of political values. And so there has been a debate in the literature about, in this sense, being political in these ways. That's an important debate and continues, but that's different from what we're talking about. What we're talking about are two things. <coughs> One is the <coughs> explicit effort, or sort of open effort by aid organizations to pursue a political goal, to say we would like this country to have more democratic governance or to be de democratic, or to have governance that's uh, politically accountable, and to explicitly make uh, political goals part of assistance. Secondly, we also think it means using political methods. And by political methods, and this is a term we can talk more about perhaps in the Q&A, by political methods we mean um, not having aid be a sort of technocratic elixir which tries to affect change without any real engagement in the political processes of the country, but aid that acts from political understanding, tries to insert itself into the, you know, the contestation among local political actors, empowering some of those actors and maybe not others, bringing them together to facilitate political processes. And in other words, methods that really bring aid into the bloodstream of change within another society as opposed to acting from a comfortable distance and just dispensing aid as though it's a form of medicine. So what we mean when we say making aid political in this sense is aid that either has explicit political goals or uses political methods. Now, <coughs> a thumbnail sketch of our argument. We start with looking at the sort of <coughs> first several decades of the modern assistance enterprise, i.e. from the early 19, late 1950s through to the end of the 1980s. Three decades in which aid built a very strong apolitical foundation and that assistance in its first phase was strongly oriented towards economic goals, uh, very much towards growth and reduction of poverty and avoided political goals, and there were efforts to inject political goals, but avoided them um, for lots of reasons, having to do with the Cold War and, and other things, but also having to do with development thinking at the time, which was quite ecumenical about the relationship of politics to economics, and many developmentalists of the 60s openly favored authoritarianism as a necessary first stage of, of development for countries. Aid was also quite apolitical in its methods. When you go back to the documents in the 1960s and 70s, you do see Unfortunately, the character of the, the blueprint approach to assistance, taking, in a sense, was Western institutional models and walking over into the developing, developing context and hoping these blueprints can serve to magically transform institutions in those. And, you know, Hirschman's critique that emerged, you know, in the second half of the 1960s was about both these things. He was saying you don't, you know, <coughs> you have to get, you have to understand the context in which you're trying to change and, and his, in a sense, his fundamental message about development, in our view, was the first, most, in a sense, powerful critique of the apolitical approach to development. So, a powerful apolitical foundation. But then, very suddenly and very strikingly, a door opens to politics in the early 1990s. And <coughs> junkies as we are of policy aid documents, this is a rather dreary science, but reading policy aid documents, it is startling in the early 1990s how quickly and how sweepingly through the assistance world aid providers shift and suddenly embrace politics openly in their documents. And they say, for example, USAID in 1991 and its policy shift, a big document shifting its policy says, political development is central to socioeconomic development. Something which for 30 years they had been avoiding and denying, suddenly they just put it forward and this is the new truth, the eternal verity of today is this. And all of the major aid agencies make this shift in the early 1990s. Why do they do so? <coughs> What's interesting, and we try to bring this out, Deanne will mention a bit more, is they do so both because of a discovery of governance in that disillusionment in the 1980s with many attempts to do market reform policies in Africa and elsewhere convinced developmentalists, we need effective states. We thought we didn't need the state for development. We need effective states. That leads you to the governance idea. And so developmentalists come to the, the political agenda that way. But at the same time, another group of people inspired by the global spread of democracy in the developing world in the 1990s say, we have to respond to this. Something huge is happening in the developing world. We need to be there. We need to help. And so these two streams come together, a very developmental governance-oriented stream and a much more political and democracy-oriented stream. And this is the opening of the door to politics. Then we take this story forward both with respect to the goals and the methods. I'll try not to go on about this too much because it's, it's a lengthy story, but what we argue is that um, on political goals that you see the pursuit of them in several different ways. 
there's some experimentation with political conditionality in the 1990s, not a very happy experience for most donors. They shift in the last 10 years to political selectivity, trying to direct aid to better political performance. Not very much used in practice, talked about a fair amount. But probably more importantly, the building of the modern structure of political assistance. There's now between seven and $12 billion a year of political assistance programs for legislative strengthening, for political party development, for elections related work, for different kinds of governance and so forth. And there's this enormous world of political aid programs, some more inspired by governance, some more inspired by democracy and so forth. So there is a rush to adopt political goals in, in some serious way, although of course plenty of hesitations and partiality and so forth. But I think a more interesting story and less well understood is how as donors move into adopting political goals, in some ways it pushes them towards por more political methods. How is this? Because as they start saying, gee, we would like to work with this parliament and help them be more effective or representative, they encounter resistance to reform and blockage and entrenched power establishments, and they say, how could aid work around that? We need to understand it better. We need to figure out who to empower alternatively. And so you see the rise of political economy analysis, which is a response to that problem. People saying, we don't understand enough about the local scene politically in order to be very effective in our political goals. But once we have that tool, we begin to use it in lots of our, uh, of our assistance. And you see the rise of, if we're going to work on governance, let's not just work from the quote top down or the supply side, but we need to work with those who are the victims of bad governance. Let's empower citizens. And the, this huge movement of both uh, bilateral aid agencies and multilaterals to open up to working with the citizen side in all its uh, mm -hmm. complicated evolution. And so both on goals and methods over the last 20 years, you see this parallel movement towards uh, a more <coughs> political conception, both in thinking and action. Now, Deanne's going to talk about s four areas in which there's sort of continuing ambiguity or complexity, then I'll come back and talk about why has this been so difficult. 